What is up you guys? Welcome to lecture 14 of this course entitled Signal Processing, where in this one we're going to be talking about mean autocorrelation and autocovariance functions of random processes which will lead us to identify what white sense stationary processes are compared to their stronger version that is strictly stationary random process. So after defining the mean, the autocorrelation and the autocovariance, we're going to state the difference between white sense stationary random processes and strictly stationary random processes. We're going to give some useful properties of the autocorrelation function that will lead us to naturally explain how the autocorrelation function behaves as a function of fluctuating random processes. Finally, we're going to end up the lecture by giving a example on random processes that arise in practical scenarios such as those in local oscillators found in radio communication systems. We're going to derive its autocorrelation function theoretically and experimentally on MATLAB. So after generating multiple random processes corresponding to the one we have, this will allow us to compute an experimental autocorrelation function to prove that the one we derived in this lecture is indeed the correct one. So without further ado, let's get started. Right, so let's consider that we have a random process denoted by X of T. And since this random process at each instant of time is naturally a random variable, so we will define a certain PDF or probability density function denoted as lowercase f x of t of x, right? So since we can attach a certain PDF to x of t, this means that we can go ahead and define the so-called mean of the process, which is nothing other than denoted as mu x of t, right? That is taken as the expectation of x of t. So using tools from statistics, we know that it is the integration over the real domain of x multiplied by the PDF of x of t, of course, integrated over x, right? So what does that mean? It means that for each instance t, I have a mean. So this mean, in contrast to random variables and random processes, this mean is a function of time. So always keep in mind the following sample space, in particular this 3D curve right here. So what we're doing is that at each time, we average over all points that vary in the S dimension or the sample dimension. So for each sample or each trial, we get multiple points, right, for a given time, and then we average over those points. So this is the mean, that's how it's defined. Now let's focus on the case where we have a strictly stationary process. That is, as we saw in the previous lecture, the joint distribution function over t points is the same even if I shift in time. So applying this formula for k equal 1, because I'm focusing on one instance of time, t, we get nothing other than that the probability distribution function over x is the same even if I shift by an amount of tau. So if this is true for all t and tau, then it has to be true regardless of t plus tau, right? This means that the time axis is, is irrelevant. So we get that both quantities could be denoted as fx of x, hence independent of time. So if I am in a strictly stationary random process, right? It means that time is, it means that my, I have only one PDF to talk about. That is also denoted by f x of x. So going back here to the mean definition, I could rewrite this. Let's rewrite this down here. The mu function is now x, but there's no time. So f x of x dx. That is mu of x. So also the mean is independent of time. So we can conclude here that in case of a strictly stationary process, okay, your mean of the random process is independent of time. So I'm going to write down the remark strictly stationary implies that mu x of t is independent 
of time so we can write mu of x okay keep this one remark in mind because this will turn out to be useful when defining or when talking about white sense stationary random processes now like the mean we can define second order moment statistics such as the autocorrelation function of the random process so now instead of assuming one time instance d we assume two instances so rx if at t1 and t2 because the autocorrelation function in general is two-dimensional okay um actually of course you can generalize this to n dimensions um but let's restrict ourselves to an autocorrelation function of two dimensions that is taken as the expectation of x t1 multiplied by x t2 okay that is by definition since we're going to define a joint pdf so x1 x2 together follow a joint pdf x1 of t x2 of t over x1 and x2 okay so this guy is the double integration from minus infinity to plus infinity of x1 x2 f x1 of t x2 of t integrated over dx1 dx2 now as we did in the mean function we're going to discuss the particular case of strictly stationary random process so for the case of k equal 2 we've got that the joint distribution function x1 t x2 t of x1 x2 is the same even if i shift by an amount of tau as such so this is true for all t and tau so so if this is true for all t and tau then why not actually this is t1 t2 and this guy is t1 t2 okay so this is true for all t1 t2 and tau so since this is true for all t1 t2 and tau then why not concentrate on the case where tau is minus t1 so that this guy right here becomes plugging tau by minus t1 we get f x1 at 0 x2 at t2 minus t1 of x1 x2 well, what i wanted to show you here is that for the case of strictly stationary random processes your joint distribution function would not loosely depend on t1 and t2 but more specifically on their difference t2 minus t1 well why do we care in terms of autocorrelation function the same applies for the pdf lowercase f x1 x2 of x1 x2 since the pdf is the derivative of the joint distribution function so the same applies here and so we can go ahead and say for the case of strictly stationary random processes that my autocorrelation function rx at t1 t2 is now the double integration over x1 x2 lowercase f x1 at 0 x2 at t2 minus t1 of x1 x2 dx1 dx2 so after this integration is done is performed you're only left with the variable t2 minus t1 so your autocorrelation function would be only a 1d function of t2 minus t1 so we can go ahead and write down as we did in the case of the mean we can go ahead and write down this statement saying for the case of strictly stationary random processes we have that my rx t1 t2 is a 1d function of seen over t2 minus t1 okay so those are two consequences of having a strictly stationary random process so going back to the lecture on white sense stationary random processes where does this come into play so all what we did so far was show you that for the case of ss strictly stationary we get that my mu x of t is independent of time and we get that my autocorrelation function is a 1d function those are consequences of being strictly stationary right um keep in mind that both the mean and the autocorrelation function provide only a, a partial description of the random process x of t so this is a one-way arrow okay so is this 
So in case you are given a random process where you were able to find in some way that your mean is independent of time and your autocorrelation function is a 1D function seen over T2 minus T1, that does not imply in any way that your random process that you started with is strictly stationary. It is not necessarily true, okay? Because those are weaker versions. Those are consequences actually of strictly stationary. So they provide necessary conditions, but not sufficient conditions, okay? Um, so in general, once you do that, once if you prove that your mean function is independent of time, and your autocorrelation function is 1D, that is, it depends on T2 minus T1, you could be sure that your random process is wide sense stationary, okay? That's why we were talking about the mean and the autocorrelation functions. Now, on the other hand, if your mean, for example, is depending on time, it is neither WSS nor is it SS. So it is neither wide sense stationary nor is it strictly stationary, okay? It is an unstationary process, okay? Now, we didn't talk about the autocovariance function. The autocovariance function is nothing other than a centered autocorrelation function. So as the autocorrelation, it is defined on two points, but instead of taking your expectation on xt1 times xt2, you center each term independently. xt1 is centered using its mean that is mu x t1 and x t2 as well is centered using mu x t2, okay? Um, so in the case of strictly stationary, your c x t1 t2 is actually the expectation over x t1 minus mu of x, right? Because it's independent of time and x t2 minus mu of x which upon expanding becomes the expectation over xt1 xt2 minus mu x expectation of xt1 minus mu x expectation over xt2 plus mu x square that is the expectation of xt1 t2 in the case of strictly stationary random processes is the autocorrelation function seen over t2 minus t1 minus now, since we have a strictly stationary random process, then the expectation of xt1 is the same as that of it. xt2 is mu of x. So both terms are mu x square, and we have our last mu x square right here. Okay, this guy cancels with this, and you're left with this part, which is actually the same in statistics. Your covariance is your correlation minus the square of your mean actually in statistics you have the following cx is the expectation of x square minus the expectation of x all square well this guy is this guy so as was the case for the autocorrelation function seen as a 1d function so in this in this equation we see, we can see that also the autocovariance function is not a, not a function of t1 and t2 but a function of their difference so this is actually cx of t2 minus t1. Okay, so let's talk a bit about the autocorrelation function. Let's give some important properties because the autocorrelation actually, so let's first rewrite the autocorrelation function in terms of a 1D variable. So right here we were using our x of t2 minus t1, right? We were saying that, oh, okay, so it is a function of t2 minus t1. And we were writing x t1, x t2. Well, in, in some references, and a notation that I like is just say that it is a function of one variable. That is tau. That is a shift. So our x of tau is e of x at t and x of t plus tau. Okay. This, pre this reserves the, the, the initial definition because t2 minus t1 is found here. And likewise, t2 minus t1 is tau. So it is still reserved. That makes sense. And this is true for all t. So we're going to be denoting from now on our x of tau as the expectation of x of t 
x of t plus tau for all t and tau. So note that our x of tau is a function of 1d, so I can go ahead and plot it, right, as such. So over tau, you plot your function, um, you know, you start as such, you might have something like this, and so on. So the first important property that I would like to talk about is the particular value when tau is 0. So at tau equal to 0, this is of course our x at 0, it is the expectation of x of t square. And what is this value right here? It is the mean square value. So you're taking the mean of the square of your random process. This is the first property. Let me redraw the um, my rx tau. State property too, because I'm really a visual guy. So I like to, you know, see what I'm talking about. So let's say this is your rx tau, a function of 1d. Actually, let's take a look at r x of minus tau. Let's see what's going on for negative phase shifts. So r x minus tau using the definition is e x at t, e x at t minus tau, right? This is true for all t, okay? Um, since it's true for all t, then let's plug in the value of four. So pick, since this is true for all t, pick t equal to well, since it's true for all t, I can go ahead and say that this is my t prime, right? I'm just ch changing notation. And I could say, pick t prime is t plus tau, okay? So my rx of minus tau is now the expectation over x. Instead of t prime, I'll put a t plus tau. And right here, I've got a t plus tau minus tau. So this guy cancels with this. And over here, I get expectation I'll write this before this. So x of t, x of t plus tau. And what did we get? Go back up here. We got our x at tau. So what does that mean? From all this discussion, we conclude that our x at tau is actually our x at minus tau. So if I go back up here, at any given tau zero, we get the same value evaluated at minus tau zero. This means we've got an even function. So the autocorrelation function is an even function over tau okay so this is property number two and the last property that i would like to talk about notice here how i picked this thing up at tau equal to zero right well that's because it is always picked up it is always the maximum is always attained at tau equal to zero and we can actually prove that following some simple steps this is proven by considering the non-negativity of the following term that is x at t plus tau plus minus x at t all square this guy is always positive right no matter what well go ahead and expand it you get expectation of x square at t plus tau so the first term square plus the second term square plus minus two first term times second term so x of t x of t plus tau okay let's distribute our expectation over all three terms, we get the expectation of x squared t plus tau plus expectation of x squared t plus minus two expectation of x of t, x of t plus tau, which is all positive. So what is this guy right here? It is the autocorrelation function, that is r x at tau, right? And what is this guy right here? This is r x at zero. Why? Go ahead and write r x at zero. So our x at zero is the expectation of x of t, x of t plus zero, so x of t, so the expectation of x t square. And that's why this guy is our x at zero. Now, since this is true for all t, means that I can go ahead and also say, oh, why not shift t by tau? So t plus tau. That's why this guy is also our x zero. So from this inequality, we can conclude that 2 rx at 0 plus or minus 2 rx at tau is positive, which means that for the case of plus, we get that my rx of 0 is greater than minus rx at tau. And for the case of minus, we get that rx of 0 is greater than or equal to rx of tau. So from here, we get that are multiplying by minus on both sides. We get that rx tau is greater than rx minus rx at zero. And from here, rx tau is less than rx zero. Combining both inequalities, we finally get that my rx of tau at any tau 
is bounded between minus rx at 0 and rx at 0. So going back to the figure up here, your rx tau is always going to be found between rx 0 and minus rx 0. This is where your autocorrelation function lives. So a bit of insights on the autocorrelation function, some intuition behind its behavior. So for example, you can encounter a autocorrelation function that is like this and goes to zero and due to the symmetry it is an even function so it goes to zero on as tau goes to minus infinity or plus infinity it is bounded by rx of zero so this is one possible autocorrelation function another one could be the following as such so what what can you conclude from both autocorrelation functions this one could be explained that the random process corresponding to this autocorrelation function is slowly fluctuating compared to the rapidly fluctuating random process we have here, okay? So the more rapidly the random process x of t changes with time, then the faster the autocorrelation function will decrease from its maximum value rx at zero. Um, I'm going to give you a small example on a random process. So let's say I'm given the following random process that is x of t, which is a cosine 2 pi f t, and this is a carrier frequency f c, for example, plus some random theta. And the randomness of theta is what is going to give rise to is why x of t is a random process. So since theta is random, it follows a certain PDF f theta of theta. Let's say that theta is a uniform random variable, so over minus pi pi, so it, it takes the value 1 over 2 pi and 0 elsewhere. This actually finds application at when talking about local oscillators found at a receiver of a radio communication system. So in most receivers you might have a part where you generate a certain random process x of t follows this equation right given fc given a but it is random because theta is random so local oscillators have a problem of initial phase being random you can't fix it to a certain value if that makes sense and this causes many synchronization problems at receivers due to the randomness of theta so that's where this finds application and why is this theta random it's because you would want to consider a cosine or a sine that is x of t relative to another signal that is the transmitted signal so it is rarely the case where the transmitted signal and the locally generated signal are synchronized together on the same phase and that's why this theta is random it's the if you will the phase difference between that phase at the local oscillator right here and the phase of the signal transmitted at the transmitter okay so what would be of interest is to study the autocorrelation function of x of t so let's say we're interested in deriving uh, an expression of rx of tau that is by definition e x t and x t plus tau. Notice here that I didn't say, oh, I have a strictly stationary random process because I'm using its formula. So one might come and ask a really nice question. Why didn't you assume your autocorrelation function to, to be a 2D function? Well, that's a nice question. And usually what we do is we start with the assumption that it is 1D and then do the math. And if what we get is independent of t, then we can say, oh, okay, we either have a strictly stationary random process or a wide sense stationary random process, if that makes sense. But if what we get is depending on time, that then it is neither nor. It is neither a strictly stationary random process, nor is it a wide sense stationary random process, okay? So let's replace our x of t, that is a cosine 2 pi f c t plus theta multiplied by x of t plus tau. So the same guy right here, but with t plus tau instead of t. So a cosine 2 pi f c t plus tau plus theta. Okay? Multiplying, we get a square cosine 2 pi f c t plus theta cosine 
2 pi fc t plus theta plus 2 pi fc tau. Now we're going to use the following identity. So using cosine a cosine b is half cosine a plus b plus half cosine a minus b. We get, since a square is constant, I'll extract it outside the expectation. So I get a square. Then I have a half due to this half right here that will be factored. Now we get the expectation of first time cosine a plus b. So this guy plus this guy gives us 4 pi fct plus 2 theta plus 2 pi fc tau. And the second term is the expectation over cosine a minus b. So since this term is the same as this term, they cancel out and we get a cosine 2 pi fc tau. Okay. Now, of course, the expectation is with respect to theta. So here we get an integration from minus pi to pi. Since the PDF of theta is defined between minus pi and pi. So we get minus pi to pi. What's within the expectation. So cosine 4 pi fct plus 2 theta plus 2 pi fc tau multiplied by the PDF, which is 1 over 2 pi in this range. So 1 over 2 pi d theta plus this term is independent of theta. So it is seen as a constant with respect to the expectation. So we rewrite as is right here. Now you can go ahead and work out this integral, which will give you zero since the integration is symmetric. So this guy is zero and we're left with the following. So Rx of tau is a square over two cosine two pi fc of tau. We're going to go to MATLAB. We're going to generate instances of the random process x of t according to this equation right here and according to this PDF of theta right here. I'm going to show you how to generate multiple instances of x of t. We're going to compute a theoretical autocorrelation function that is this and an experimental one and compare both. See if what we derived is correct. So let's go to MATLAB. I've got the following script and over here. Let's say my carrier frequency is 5 Hertz, my sampling period is 0.01 seconds, and I'm going to be interested in a time axis sampled by, of course, at TS, and ends at 1, okay? I'm going to pick an amplitude of, let's say, 10. So my theta is actually random between minus pi and pi. So RAND generates a number between 0 and 1. If I multiply by 2 pi, it's between 0 and 2 pi. It's a random uniform random distribution between 0 and 2 pi and if I subtract pi I get a random I get a uniform random distribution between minus pi and pi okay and if I generate only one instance of x only one I can go ahead and write down the formula of x of t right here so I go a cosine 2 pi fc t plus theta you can finally go ahead and plot x versus t and you get your simple cosine so if I go ahead and do this multiple times so if I put a hold on you can see each each time I start at a different phase and that's because of the randomness of theta. Now what I want is to generate let's say a thousand let's say I want to run a thousand experiments so at each experiment I generate a different x of t due to theta and so we'd want to generate let's say I have a variable called an experiment so the number of experiments I want to conduct a thousand experiments so I have to generate naturally a thousand thetas according to a uniform random distribution. And then I'll get 1000 X's. So running this, there you go. So this is really not informative because it's a 2D plot. What would be of interest is to remove this plotting and plot on a 3D plot. As we did in the lecture on random processes, we did a 3D plot showing one dimension ac across the samples or experiments, another dimension over time, and the Z dimension over the values taken by the random process. So mesh grid of the time axis and the experiment axis as such, get their grids. And finally, plot a surface plot, T, E, X. Run, and there you go. This dimension right here is the time axis. This dimension right here is the experiment axis and the z-axis is the values. So a is 10 and that's why your cosine is moving between minus 10 and 10. Go ahead, 
and give an X label. So this is time. Your Y label is experiments and Z label is X60 as such. Okay. Of course, each time I run this, if I didn't set a certain seed, I'm going to get a different plot due to the randomness of theta. Okay, so right now I've got my processes, X of T. What remains to do is two things. First, we're going to compute the experimental autocorrelation function and then compare it with the theoretical one and see if what we derived is actually correct, right? So to that extent, let's define the tau variable, right? Actually, let's go before everything, let's define it over here, tau shift. This is going to be an index. Let's say it's an index between zero and 50, right? Um, but since our sampling period is TS, then we mean that each shift is a multiple of TS. So in, as a matter of fact, if I go ahead and say, oh, I have R at two or R at three, this means that this is actually R at T two times TS. And this is actually R three times TS, okay? But since this is an array, I can go ahead and type this. It's a numbered array. It's an array that takes in indices instead of fractions. So I'm going to, comp I'm going to loop over those shifts as such. And I'm going to compute for each tau. So notice here I did tau plus one because it starts at zero, so tau plus one. And you would want to go ahead and use the formula. So over here, we're going to use this formula right here. Okay. So if we use this, notice how we should multiply. Actually, first let's, let's focus on one X. So this is one X of T. So the first trial, let's say we're going to multiply it by X of T plus tau. So what you'd want to do is, so this is one X X. Since this is, um, first let's try to compute it for T equal to zero. Okay. So for T equal to zero, we will pick the first index and the second one is T plus tau. So one plus tau, and we're going to take the expectation over the sample dimension. So this dimension right here. So what we get over here is a vector and we're going to take the mean, the expectation. So this is R evaluated at T equal one. I want to show you that no matter what the T you pick, you're going to get the same autocorrelation function. So let's say this is, guy is at T equal to one. Let's compute another one at T equal to 10, for example, T equal to 10 as such, and compare both and see if we get the same result. So tau shift, plot tau shift and scale it with TS plot the first time R1 and hold on and plot R10 this time. Put a legend, say R at time t equal to one and R at time t equal to 10. And you get the same, oh, let me comment out this. You get the same autocorrelation function. So that means that your autocorrelation function is independent of t but would rather depend on tau instead of t um so this is your autocorrelation function i don't need r10 and r1 is just r right so we're going to plot only one put some grids and label your x-axis say tau your y-axis as r of tau and now let's go ahead and compute the theoretical autocorrelation function so r theo is according to what we got over here it is this guy right here so it is a square over two times cosine two pi fc times the tau shift axis but you have to scale it with ts because those are indices taken shifts a factor ts and let's go ahead and plot the same plot hold on plot tau shift scale it with ts and plot r theoretical and see if we get the same thing and there you go so let's give a label first one is experimental autocorrelation and the second one is theoretical autocorrelation i'm oh, sorry this is a legend not a label so run and there you go so run and there you go 
So what we did was correct. Okay, so that's all I have to say in this lecture, where we first define the mean of a random process, followed by a consequence in the case of strictly stationary, and likewise the autocorrelation of a random process, followed by a consequence for strictly stationary random processes. Then, based on the mean and covariance, we defined the weaker version of strictly stationary random processes, that is, the widely sent stationary random process or weakly stationary random process, WSS. We then define the autocovariance function of a random process. And then we zoomed in on the autocorrelation function, gave some useful properties, and intuitively illustrated how the autocorrelation function behaves as a function of fluctuation of the random process associated with that autocorrelation function. We gave an example on a local oscillator used in radio communication systems and why we define a random process in that context of local oscillation due to the random phase of that oscillator. We derived the autocorrelation function of the oscillator and on MATLAB, we generated different instances of that random process and we proved that indeed the theoretical autocorrelation function aligns with the practical or the experimental computed one. So thanks for watching. In case you found this lecture beneficial, please leave a like on the video, subscribe to the channel. If you have any questions whatsoever, kindly leave a comment down in the comment section below. I'll make sure I'll get to it as soon as possible. Also consider donating to my Patreon account any amount you wish. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in future lectures.